Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Nicholas Manousis. I'm the president of the Horological Society of New York, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to our September meeting. First things first, welcome back. Uh, it was, uh, we had a little bit of a summer break. July and August we took off, but it's, it's great to be back here. It's great to get back into, into the swing of things, and I, I hope everyone had, had a very nice summer. We have, a, uh, of, of course, a, a few announcements to get through before we uh, uh, get on with, with the lecture for tonight. So new members and lapel pins, uh, as usual, I, I know I met a few new members uh, earlier tonight. If there are any other new members who would like to pick up their lapel pins, uh, please come and see me uh, after the meeting. I'd be very happy to, to give you your pin. So some events that are, that are coming up soon. So this is the, uh, the American Watchmakers Clockmakers Institute National Convention coming up very soon, October 4th through the 7th in Tampa, Florida. And the AWCI is the national organization for uh, watch and clock making uh, professionals. Uh, every year they hold the national convention. Uh, it travels to different cities across the country. And uh, if you work in the watchmaking industry, I highly recommend that you, uh, that you attend the convention. Uh, I attend every year. I get a lot out of it, uh, both from an ed educational perspective and from a networking perspective. You know, we, we're lucky to live here in New York, but it's, uh, there is a, a watchmaking industry outside of New York, and it's, it's really nice uh, to meet and, uh, and talk with some of our colleagues from around the country, and the AWCI National Convention provides a place to do, uh, to do that. So I highly recommend it if you're in, if you're in the industry, uh, check it out. Uh, you, there's still time to register. Uh, it's just about a month away uh, in Tampa, Florida. I know there's going to be a, a, a small contingent of uh, HSNY staff that will be there, and so we're, we're, ho we're hoping to, to see a, a very nice turnout, a large crowd down in Tampa. Traveling education, you know, we took a little bit of a break for, uh, for summer with the traveling education classes, but uh, we're now uh, back and ready to get into the swing of things. Uh, and uh, we're going to be visiting uh, Miami, Florida and Baltimore, Maryland. And those are coming up uh, those weekends, September 30th weekend and the October 7th weekend. So if you have any friends in Miami or Baltimore, you want to let them know about the classes. Uh, registration is open now and uh, we'll be making uh, um, some announcements about, uh, about the classes later this week. Uh, so we're uh, looking forward to getting uh, down to those cities. And this is kind of a, a special occasion because uh, we're celebrating uh, one year of traveling education. Uh, back in September 2016, uh, Mr. Vincent Robert, who you can see there uh, uh, speaking in this class, uh, Came to, the, came to the society and he had this idea to take our, our, our classes that we, that we teach here in New York, upstairs on the fourth floor here, and bring them to a wider audience across the country. And I'm happy to say that, uh, that our educational team here at HSNY has done an absolutely wonderful job with these classes. Uh, over the last year, we visited uh, 10 different cities across the country and we've, uh, we've taught over 300 students uh, uh, in those cities. Uh, so Vincent is actually not here tonight, uh, but I think we should all give him a round of applause because I'm sure he'll be watching online later. All right. Tonight's lecture. So at, uh, at HSNY, we normally don't talk about politics, but tonight is an exception because we're gonna talk about how politics have influenced uh, timekeeping throughout history. And uh, the speaker we have tonight is an absolute expert on, on the subject. He's a prolific author uh, on horology. He's written four books, and he's a professor at Queens College here in New York City. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kevin Berth. Thank you. 
It's a real pleasure being here. I thank the Society for inviting me. And I also think this is such a wonderful place to have the meetings with such wonderful collections around us, including a collection of locks, which I will mention briefly are related to clocks. I'll mention that a bit later. And before I get started, I also want to give a special thanks to the museums and the collections that have allowed me to use their images. Our museums are a treasure and their collections are absolutely essential for our continuing in the scholarship of studying the history of horology. And many museums are starting to realize how popular this subject is and are putting more effort into displaying their clocks and watches. So I strongly encourage you to support these museums, to visit these museums, to look at their collections. Now it's with some trepidation that I'm here tonight. Anthropology has not always been kind to clocks and watches. The founder of my department, Hortense Powdermaker, describes in her memoir how early on in her field research in the South Pacific, she went swimming with her watch on, and it never worked afterwards. Her mentor, Bronislav Malinowski, describes what I would call baptizing three different watches with seawater, thereby destroying their functionality. So I applaud your courage in inviting me here tonight, but I question your judgment in allowing me to have a bottle of water. Anthropologists have a hard time studying time. When you think about it, if we just walk up to someone on the street and say, what is your concept of time? The answer is typically somebody looks at their watch and would say something like, it's about 10 after 7. On the surface, that is not a very interesting response. But if you start to think about it, it's a very unusual response. First of all, it assumes that people have personal timepieces, and we're unusual in that regard. When you look at other cultures, when you think about the past, most people did not wander around with personal timepieces. So that by itself is unusual. But what is even more unusual is the assumption that all these timepieces are synchronized. That is something that has only been possible in recent times. We're weird. And as an anthropologist, I'm drawn to the weird. Now to put in context of how weird this is, in 1711, the poet Alexander Pope said in his essay on criticism, our judgments, like our watches, none go just alike, yet each believes his own. I have a lot of friends who are cricket fans. If all our judgments go like our watches today, then all of you are cricket fans too, right? No? Okay. So our judgments actually today differ much more than our watches. Whereas in 1711, our watches indicated quite different times. My journey in studying this topic began with field research in Trinidad and Tobago. And during that field research, I remember talking to a retired foreman from the Department of Public Works. This was the department that repaired the roads, and this was in rural Trinidad. And he described how one day he almost got himself into trouble. As a foreman, he was charged with determining when to let the workers on his crew go home. And one day he let them go early. Soon afterwards, the supervisor showed up and said, you let your workers go early. My friend was facing a possible reprimand. But he pulled out his watch, and while it was only 4.30, and while quitting time was 5, he pulled out his pocket watch, showed it to the supervisor, and said, sir, this is the time with which I work. The watch said 5 o'clock. Now, the trick is basically like this. Nick, what time is it? It's about 7.11. Okay, he says it's 7.11. He says it's 7-Eleven, but 
It's 7.44 now. Nice colonial foreman trick. And I better set it back to 7.11 or I'm going to finish my talk real fast. It's a simple trick. My friend knew how to, while the pocket watch was in his pocket, pull out the stem, turn it, and change the time. So that even if he let his workers go early, if the supervisor showed up, he could change the time to show like he didn't let them go early. And the worst that can happen is the supervisor would tell him he needed to get his watch worked on. But couldn't give him a reprimand. This sort of use of clocks to manipulate is something that I became very interested in. But to explore it, I had to rethink the history of horology. This is the history that we commonly tell. It's what I call a lineal ancestral history. We take the assumption that the conclusion of the history is our modern technology. And then we look at everything that leads to the modern technology. This approach has produced many, many high quality works, wonderful books, wonderful articles. But it leaves out a lot of the story. If we were to go back in time and look forward, we would actually see a very different story. We'd see lots of techniques that have fallen into disuse. Some of these techniques you might be familiar with, like water clocks or sand glasses. Um, candle clocks, those are a bit more obscure. Sundials you probably know of. Shadow length, maybe, maybe not. Uh, quadrants. I put key and lock there because the First generation of regulated clockmakers tend to be in locksmith guilds and even locksmiths themselves. In fact, as late as the 19th century, the great horologist Antide Janvier suggested that in France they train locksmiths to build public clocks in all the small towns that did not yet have a public clock. Now these are just devices and techniques. If we start looking at how hours are counted we get this diversity, and I'm going to talk about all of these with the exception of Anglo-Saxon hours. I won't really mention those at all tonight. These coexisting are examples of what I call time pluralism. Time pluralism is when there are many ways of reckoning time coexisting at once. Now, we're not used to that today. We're used to our synchronized watches that all indicate the same time. But there have been many points in history and many places where multiple ways of reckoning time have coexisted at the same time. And I'm interested in how that gets used. A good example is embodied in this clock. Now, if you've ever written a blog about clocks or watches, if you've ever written something about time and had no editorial control over the images that get associated with your writing, this will probably accompany it. This is the great astronomical clock in Prague. Uh, it's a famous clock. It's uh, probably made more famous because it served as the model for the clock on Hogwarts Castle in the Harry Potter movies. But it's also a clock that reflects time pluralism. You have the outer ring which moves about independently of the rest of the dial. The outer ring reflects what are called Bohemian or Italian hours. These are counted from 1 to 24 beginning after sundown. Then you have this ring, which has the hours that we're familiar with. You could call them common hours. At the time, they would have been called small clock hours because they were the hours that were displayed on small clocks. Then you have this set of lines. These lines, and you can barely see the numbers, the lines represent the temporal or canonical hours. These vary in length with the season. During the winter, they're shorter. During the summer, they're longer. And then you have the sun, which is on this hour hand. And since the sun is also mounted to the zodiac ring, as the zodiac ring spins, it affects where the sun is relative to the temporal hours. This is a bit easier to see from a drawing. 
where you have the Italian hours, or Bohemian hours as they're also called, the common hours, and then the lines representing the temporal hours. There was actually during this period a preference for the Bohemian hours. And the reason for that is during this time, a lot of labor was done based on daylight. You always knew when the sun was going to set from Italian hours. You didn't know that from the common hours that we use. If you were traveling and you knew the gates would close, the gates of a city would close at sundown, you would also know when the gates would close based on the chiming of the Italian hours. So these were quite useful for travelers and workers during this period, in many ways much more useful than the small clock hours, but much more difficult to carry out in making a clock that would indicate them because each day the Italian hours would have to change as sundown changed. And as a result, this clock becomes a means of converting between these different systems. I have a drawing from late March and a drawing from the middle of July. You'll notice 20 o'clock lines up differently here than here. And you'll notice that the sun is positioned between the 8th and 9th canonical hour there, whereas here in the middle of July, it's positioned on the 9th canonical hour. So this great clock in Prague not only displays time pluralism, it provides a means of converting between three different time scales. And this clock is not alone in this regard. There are actually many clocks of this sort. There are many monumental clocks like this. Then there are clocks such as this. This is at the Frick Collection. It's a Weber masterpiece clock. This too has Italian hours in that gold ring, the common hours there, and then you'll see this bit, which is part dark and part silver. That represents what are called great hours or Nuremberg hours. In the city of Nuremberg, they counted the daytime hours separate from the nighttime hours. So during midsummer, 16 o'clock in the day would be followed by one o'clock at night, and eight o'clock at night would be followed by one o'clock in the day. This shutter system expands and contracts, so during the winter, the black area is greater, and during the summer, the silver area is greater, and just eyeballing this, since they're half and half, you already know that the clock is currently set to the equinox. And there is actually a calendar indicator here, and it's actually set to the spring equinox. These clocks, I wouldn't say they were common, but they were well known. Here's another example. This one is from uh, Nuremberg. A very similar sort of design. Again, you see the black and then you see the silver. Italian hours, common hours. Here's one from Krakow. This one is a bit different in that you have the Italian hours. They're really hard to see, but they're on this inner gold ring. And then you have the common hours around here. And it's not just clocks. These are found on sundials. This is a sundial from Nuremberg, which labels the Deutsch and the foreign hours in Venice. And here's another one that's quite elaborate. Gives the number of hours of daylight, the number of hours of darkness, Italian hours, what are called Babylonian hours. That was a count of hours beginning with sunrise and counting till 24. They appear in paintings, such as this one from Holland, or this one from Spain. And we might be tempted to think that these were simply clocks for the elite. And while they were clocks for the elite, it was time for everyone. The traveler, Johann Georg Kaisler, in the late 18th century, describes how the hour system in Nuremberg is quite confusing for travelers. And his suggestion wasn't buy a Nuremberg clock. His suggestion was just go out on the street and buy a broadside, buy a one-page printed conversion between the different hour systems. 
And in fact, this is how most people dealt with these different hour systems. They didn't have a clock. They listened to the public signals from the local churches and then would convert that into whatever hour system they wanted using a piece of paper that did the conversion for them. So on this, we have Greek hours. Greek hours are 1 to 24 beginning at midnight. Astronomical hours, they're 1 to 24 beginning at noon. Small clock hours, that's the common hours that we use. Nuremberg hours, I just described those, different counts for day and night. And this part with the Nuremberg hours is actually a piece of paper that slides back and forth, depending on the time of year. Uh, and Bohemian or Italian hours, which is 1 to 24, beginning soon after sundown. You remember that Goethe quote, the bells don't ring all the same? Well. This gives an indication of what these people were dealing with. The bells were definitely not ringing all the same. And these were not unusual, although not many have survived. I know three of these have survived. Only one of these, this is another conversion. Uh, this particular one gives the uh, means of calculating Easter, the golden number and the dominical love letter, but it also allows you to convert between different hour systems. On the left is the Nuremberg hours. You can tell it's the Nuremberg hours because they're equally spaced, but here you'll notice there's shading starting at eight o'clock. That's because starting at eight o'clock, it shifts to nighttime and you'll notice after eight is the first hour of the night. The middle column is the common hours that we're used to. And then the right hand column, you'll notice the spacing of the hours differs between summer and winter, those are the canonical or temporal hours. So having to convert between these systems was quite common once upon a time. And it remains so into the late 18th century. Again, from Goethe's Italian travels, he comes up with his own way of converting between Italian hours and the timekeeping he is used to. Or here we have, during the French Revolution, you may know the French Revolution imposed decimal time on the 18th of October, 1793. That's 27th of Vendemar, for those of you who are hardcore French Revolutionary fans. And what the Committee on Public Instruction suggested was that most people wouldn't be able to afford a decimal clock. So what they should do is they should acquire what the committee called a mont économique, a paper sheet that had a diagram of a clock that would allow them to convert the new French decimal hours into whatever time system they were familiar with. Unfortunately, I've never seen one of these mont économiques. I've only seen drawings of them in books, but I've never actually seen one of the broadsides. These aren't the only things going on at, during the period. There was also a realization of the equation of time, the difference between apparent solar time and mean time as displayed on clocks. Now the reason for this is multiple, but the easiest component to explain and show is there's the sun, here's the earth. A 360 degree rotation of the earth brings it to a different orientation relative to the sun depending on where it is in the orbit. So the day isn't a 360 degree rotation. The day is either a little bit shorter or a little bit longer. So very few days are exactly 24 hours long. Now if you graph this, you get a graph that looks like this. The length of the day in solar time relative to mean time. If you take that graph and you put it on a piece of circular graph paper, you get a kidney. With that kidney, you can attach a cam. With the cam, you can have one hand that represents solar time and gets adjusted forwards and backwards based on the kidney, and another hand that represents mean time. And this is a clock at the Frick Collection as well that shows both the solar, apparent solar time and the mean time. 
Now, so far, I haven't really talked about politics. I've just sort of been introducing all of this stuff that's going on, all the choices that could be made. And in many ways, orology is about choices. One thing to keep in mind is that most people's understanding of orology, they obtain early in primary school. They end their orological education at about the age of six when they learn how to read a clock. But you know clocks and watches are far more complicated than that. One of the amazing things, I would say miraculous things about clocks and watches is they take all this complicated understanding of orology and package it in a way that even a six-year-old can understand it. Clocks are mediators of knowledge. They're a means of mediating between this complex knowledge and people with very little knowledge. Because of that, clocks can be a means of regulating, even manipulating people. If you control the time, you can control the people. Now the first set of cases that I'm going to talk about are going to come from the late medieval period. Um, I love this quote about the uh, clock in the Palace of Justice in Paris. Charles V, King of France, decided to put a clock in the Palace of Justice and insist that every clock in the city be synchronized to it. Uh, apparently, the clock did not perform very well. But out of all the clocks not performing well in the city of Paris, since this was the king's clock, you had to pay attention to it. In some ways, this is a reflection on the clock. In other ways, it's a reflection on the king. Time was a direct means of controlling people in the late medieval period. Now, my examples are going to come from the city of York. That's simply because that's a city where I've done a lot of research. And I'm going to begin with the idea of the curfew. Legend has it that William the Conqueror imposed the curfews on England in order to control the unruly Anglo-Saxons. Now, there's some circumstantial evidence for it. The word curfew itself comes from the French cover fire. And in fact, there's a fire cover and it's called a curfew. In the case of York, the curfew bell was not rung by the city. It was rung by the abbey outside of the city walls, the Abbey of St. Mary's. And the Abbey of St. Mary's was actually founded by William the Conqueror. The curfew bell was an important one. Even when it wasn't used to maintain order, it was used to regulate the workday. And that was true well into the 18th century. We find a poem by Thomas Gray, Elegy, written in a country churchyard. The curfew tolls the knell of parting day. The lowing herd winds slowly over the lee. The plowman homeward plods his weary way and leaves the world to darkness and to me. St. Mary's curfew bell wasn't the only bell of importance in York. York had a set of markets, and the markets were regulated by bells and the clocks that determined the chiming of the bells. One of the most important markets was at pavement. It's called pavement because it was the first street in York that was paved. It was rung by this church, All Saints Pavement, and we have a whole set of regulations over a 200-year span from the 14th century on, which state that the opening of the market in pavement was determined by the time as chimed by All Saints Pavement. All Saints Pavement was not just any church. It was a church controlled by the local merchant guild. So the merchant guild was using the clock in this church to control the market that it regulated. But this wasn't the only market in York. Not too far away was a different market, Thursday market. This market was run by the city. The guilds and the city government were two separate political entities. They respected one another, but they didn't always agree with one another, and they didn't always listen to one another. So this market being controlled by the city was controlled by a different clock and a different bell. 
the one on St. William's Chapel on Oosebridge. Now, while this is a chapel, it's best viewed as a municipal building because it contained the chambers of the Lord Mayor and it contained the chambers of the city council. So it was really a city building. And its clock tower was a rather curious construction. The dials did not face towards the market. The dials faced up and down the Ouse River. Now, the Ouse River during this time was a tidal river. You could put your boat at the mouth of the Ouse, and when the tide came in, the tide would propel your boat all the way up to York. Then when the tide went out, it would take your boat all the way back to the Humber. So that's why the dials of the clock faced up and down the river. The slats for the bell tower only face one direction. They're not slats on the other side of the bell tower. It only faces towards Thursday market. This is a big resonating chamber to project the sound of the bell directly to the market. And the time of this clock did not match the time of pavement and did not match the clock at St. Mary's. There's a curious regulation about the selling of food at night that was passed by the city council. And this regulation prohibited the sale of food at night from the time that evening song was struck by this church, and this church actually belonged to the abbey, and when the morning bell was struck at York Minster. York Minster is yet a separate political entry, uh, entity from the guilds and from the city council and from the abbey. So York Minster had its own clocks and kept its own time separate from everybody else. Now the interesting thing about this regulation, combining as it did a church associated with the Abbey and York Minster, neither of which the city had any control over, was it actually probably shortened the amount of time at night that the sale of food in large quantities was prohibited. And the reason for this is that the Abbey's position had an unobstructed view of the western horizon. So there evening song bell was the last evening song bell to chime in the city. The Minster had a relatively unobstructed view of the eastern horizon, so its morning bell was probably the first morning bell to chime in the city. Now to give a sense of how confusing this would all be if you were living in York, here's a map of the city of York indicating where each of these sources of time was. And it's clear, if you had to negotiate the city of York, you had to know which bell was which. If you had to do business in the city of York, you had to know which bell was which. And the control of the bells and the control of the clocks were a means of directly controlling the actions of people. I want to turn now to the Habsburgs. Go across the English Channel and talk about continental Europe. The Habsburg Empire during this period, during the early modern period, could be described as a rather loose centralized polity in that there are a lot of free cities that were able to determine their own methods of timekeeping. We see this with Nuremberg hours, we see this with common hours, we see this with bohemian hours, and so on. So when it comes to the empire as a whole, the sort of clocks that I showed earlier that include multiple hour systems are quite common among the Habsburgs. And not only were they common, they were an important component of diplomacy and gift giving. Many of these clocks, you can begin to identify to whom the clock might have been given or at least intended. The clock at the Frick was custom made for 48 degrees, 15 minutes north latitude. That's not a common latitude to make a clock with an astrolabe for. That is the latitude of a palace of the Wittelsbox, the ruling family of Bavaria. So this clock was no doubt custom made for this one particular ruling family and was intended as a gift. It has other features that intended, seem to indicate it was a gift. 
It's a bit idiosyncratic. It has a saint's calendar with some unusual saints on it. The unusual saints have to do with pregnancy, childcare, widowhood, and being a second wife. It celebrates the patron saint of being a second wife. The calendar is so small, the print is so small, that you have to be nearsighted or use a microscope to be able to read it. And there are also a lot of patron saints about eye problems on it. My hunch is that the clock was specifically made for Anna Maria of Austria, the second wife of Maximilian, the ruler of Bavaria, who had just died before the clock was completed. I also have a hunch that the clock was never given because it was made by a staunch Protestant and includes some features that a good Catholic like the Wittelsbachs might not have found terribly pleasing. Such clocks were important parts of reciprocal relationships among European nobility and between the Habsburgs and other empires. They were commonly given as gifts for what were called Kunstkammer or Wunderkammer. They were also an important part of the tribute paid to the Ottoman Empire. This gentleman was an ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, and he's probably most famous for bringing the tulip back to Europe, but he did leave a very interesting set of letters about his time in the Ottoman court. And in this one letter, he describes how an envoy from the Habsburg Emperor, Ferdinand II, brought a clock st skillfully crafted with a tower on an elephant's back to present to the Sultan. A clock like this. Now, we have no way of knowing whether this was the clock given to the Ottoman Sultan. Uh, rumor has it that the Sultan did commonly sell these clocks or melt them down when he was ceased to be amused with them. But the other feature of these sorts of clocks is that they were commonly made and distributed around Europe as well. So they're actually, I know of about 10 clocks that are elephants with a clock on its back. Um, now the, of all the 10 clocks, I know this is one of the two with the most Turkish features. So this might have been intended for Turkey or then it might have just been intended for somebody else in Europe. Interestingly, getting back to the theme of time pluralism, the empires to which the Habsburgs gave their clocks de developed their own orological traditions. So in Turkey, they developed a thriving clock-making tradition, produced some spectacular clocks, but all the while they maintained what was called a la Turca time. A la Turca time is a count of hours from zero to 12, beginning first at sunrise, then at sundown. And depending on the time of year, these hours expand and contract. So here's a sundial that allows the conversion between the hours on the clock, which are the red lines, and the hours of the sun, which are the black lines. The Ottoman Empire maintained these two ways of reckoning time until the fall of the empire and the beginning of modern Turkey. In the case of Japan, this is a clock given to the shogun uh, Tokugawa Iyasu. It's a very typical sort of table clock from Europe. And the Japanese took it and did something remarkable. The Japanese system of reckoning time is six hours of daylight, six hours of darkness. They change in length depending on the time of year. So it's only at the equinoxes that the daytime hours and the nighttime hours are of equal length. So they came up with a variety of ways of adapting European orology to their Japanese needs. On this particular clock, you'll see they have two foliates. One is for the daytime, one is for the nighttime. With the, where the weights are positioned determines the oscillation of the folia. Inside the clock, they have a couple of cams, there and there. These cams, one will lift up the one folia so it's disengaged from the crown wheel, while the other 
folia remains engaged to the crown wheel. So only one folia is engaged to the crown wheel at one time, and when the clock makes a partial revolution, it shifts from the one cam to the other. The cams turn and pushes one folia to be disengaged. The Japanese continued with this time system and European timekeeping until 1873. The Habsburgs seem to embrace cosmopolitanism. The politics of their timekeeping was to recognize all these different hour systems and then present clocks as gifts recognizing those hour systems. The British and the French had a different perspective. The British and the French seemed to want to impose one time on the entire world. But even they had some trouble. This is from Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days. It's a wonderful book from a timekeeping perspective. The first line of the book gives Phileas Fogg's exact address in London. And then there's this exchange when he encounters Passapartout. Passapartout carries a genuine chronometer. And yet Fogg is saying that Passapartout's chronometer is off by four minutes, four minutes slow. How could that be? Well, during this period, there were no time zones. So Passapartout's chronometer was not set to London time. If you calculate it, it was actually set to Portsmouth, England. This ability to choose different times allows the ability to manipulate. I like to always include something a bit local in my talks, so I'm now to the New York person, portion and Fernando Wood. Fernando Wood is probably most famous as the mayor who created Central Park. He is also notorious for being the mayor that wanted New York City to join the Confederacy during the Civil War. He was a pro-South, pro-slavery mayor. In 1858, he had left the Tammany Hall faction of New York City politics, in part because Tammany Hall was willing to compromise on slavery. Wood wanted slavery to be unregulated throughout the United States. But Wood wanted the Democratic Party to nominate a pro-slavery candidate. And for Wood, Stephen Douglas, who ran, eventually would run against Lincoln, was not pro-slavery enough. Because Stephen Douglas still wanted this compromise of free, slates and free states and slave states. Wood wanted there to be slavery everywhere. So Wood was in this bit of a quandary. He wanted to have a pro-slavery southern Democratic nominee for the presidency, and yet he had just left the most powerful faction of New York City politics, Tommy Hall. How would he achieve his goal of being able to get a delegation from New York to the National Convention that included his delegates as opposed to, say, Tommy Hall delegates? He hatched a plan based on time differences. There were no time zones. The convention was going to be held in Syracuse. And the time difference between, local time difference between Syracuse and New York City is about 12 minutes. Wood knew that while the local time in Syracuse was 12 minutes off of New York City time, within a block of the convention hall was the New York, New York Central Railroad Station. And the New York Central Railroad ran on New York City time. So the first clock that people would see when they got off the train would indicate New York City time, not Syracuse time. So he loaded a railroad car with delegates who were not official delegates and some people who I would call enforcers, went up to Syracuse, and at 12 o'clock New York Central Railroad time, they took the convention hall, appointed a chairman of the convention, and started to pass rules for the selection of delegates. At 12 o'clock Syracuse time, the Tommy Hall people and the upstate New York people came into the hall and encountered Wood and his people in control of the podium. And Wood and his people included the world champion boxer at the time, who apparently decked, punched the uh, 
person from the Tomney Hall faction who Tomney Hall wanted to chair the convention, causing him to seek medical help. Woods people then drew pistols, won the fight, and the Tomney Hall people had to retreat from the convention hall. And Wood then was able to select delegates. After Wood and his faction were finished selecting delegates, then the Tomney Hall people slunk back into the hall, had their own convention, but they decided they didn't really want to divide the Democratic Party that much, so they decided they would compromise somewhat. Like I said, there were no time zones at this time. In England, the situation had been settled by a case called Curtis versus March. In Curtis versus March, a defendant had shown up for his trial 10 minutes late, but he claimed he had showed up on time. The reason for the dispute is the judge in Dorchester was using Greenwich Mean Time for the court proceedings. The defendant was using local Dorchester time. So the defendant appealed to the court of the exchequer, and the court of the exchequer decided that the true time for legal purposes was not Greenwich Mean Time. The true time for legal purposes was local mean time. So they gave this gentleman a new trial. Now this difference is still displayed in a few clocks. This is the corn exchange clock from Bristol, which shows, whoops, which shows with its red hand, Bristol time, and then with the black hand, Greenwich time. This was a big deal for the temperance movement. One way to get a bar in trouble is to get them to serve alcohol after hours. One of the oldest police tricks in the book, show up after the closing time, order a drink, and if served, bust the bar. For this reason, there's this whole genre of clocks in England that, you know, they're collector's items. They're called tavern clocks, or sometimes active parliament clocks, because they are basically the sorts of clocks that taverns and pubs used to ensure that they had the correct time. But the problem is that the time that they got was based on the public clocks or from time signals from Greenwich. And in this wonderful little story from York, we find Chief Baron Pollock of the York Police Force telling us the true time at any place is the, not is the mean excuse me the true time at any place is the mean time at that place not greenwich time unfortunately all the clocks in york display greenwich time but the police know the true local time so the police were busting bars based on the 3 minute difference between york and greenwich now, Parliament seemed to be made up of drinkers because within months of this article being published, Parliament decided to make Greenwich Mean Time the official time of all of England, at which time at least one pub owner got revenge. In this case from Hull, the pub owner says, I was not serving alcohol after the hour. I can prove that my clock was synchronized with Greenwich the police witness cannot demonstrate that his clock was synchronized with Greenwich. And the judge said, since it couldn't be proved that the police witness's clock was synchronized with Greenwich, the pub was let off the hook. So now we're to our weirdness, where synchronization matters, where uniformity matters, where all the clocks must run alike. But we have a problem. The problem is called Earth. Earth is not a reliable time giver. Earth is slowing down. And because Earth is slowing down, and because we like atomic clocks, we know how much the Earth is slowing down. This is a graph of the Earth slowing down relative to atomic time. Because the Earth is slowing down, but we still have this fondness for Earth rotation, we have something called the leap second, which helps us adjust to the fact that we're actually trying to manage two different times, atomic time and Earth time. 
It's sort of the fudge factor of modern time pluralism. When the difference between rotational time becomes too great for comfort, the International Earth Rotation and Reference System calls over to the International Bureau of Weights and Measures and says we need a leap second. And then six months from then, a second is inserted at midnight at the prime meridian. And this keeps our clocks roughly in sync with Earth rotation. But not everybody is happy about leap seconds. In a world which depends on synchronization, a millisecond in financial markets is a big deal. A second is a huge deal. A second is enough to cause computers to crash if they aren't expecting that level of difference. So whenever a leap second is announced, some systems administrators look forward with dread, knowing that in the past, crucial systems have crashed because of synchronization problems. Others, such as Google or Japan's banking system, smugly develop clever solutions to avoid the crash. Uh, their solution is something called the leap smear. They add a millisecond at increments throughout the day so that it adds up to a second at the end of the day. Because of the problems created by leap seconds, there are lots of people, particularly computer people, who want to get rid of leap seconds. But there are other people, particularly those who track objects in the sky, for whom Earth rotation is still important. If you're tracking the asteroids that may hit us, the satellites orbiting us, or heaven forbid, a North Korean rocket coming our way, you care a lot about Earth rotation and how the Earth is rotating relative to the motion of the objects coming at us. So the sky watching people want to keep an Earth-bound time. The computer people want to get rid of the leap second. And one of the arguments is that trying to maintain the leap second is going to create time pluralism, is going to create different people running their own time scales, which is in fact already the case. This is the control box for an atomic clock produced by Meinberg, a major uh, high precision timekeeping company. Here you'll notice some letters like NP, NTP, GPS, PTP. NTP stands for Network Time Protocol. GPS you're probably familiar with. It tells you where you are on the planet. And PTP stands for Precision Time Protocol. This is itself its own interesting sort of time pluralism. And it reflects the difference between precision and accuracy that time metrologists are very much interested in. Accuracy is the ability of the clock to indicate the correct time. Precision is the ability of a clock to indicate small increments of time. Now, you can have a clock that's extremely precise, but if it's not set to the correct time, it's not accurate. Or you could have a clock that's extremely accurate, but it's only accurate because it's constantly synchronized, and because it's constantly being synchronized, it can't be very precise. NTP is something that synchronizes computer clocks, and basically the way it works, put simply, is it takes synchronization signals from multiple clocks and calculates an average and then uses the average to synchronize the computer clock. The problem with calculating an average is whenever you calculate an average, there's a range of error. If there's a range of error, that prevents a certain level of precision. PTP is a time protocol that instead of using multiple clocks to produce an average, uses just GPS time and then has a very high quality local clock that calibrates and synchronizes with GPS. So PTP involves very high levels of precision down to the nanosecond level whereas NTP is pretty much down to microseconds. That may not sound like a big deal, but the data feeds from the stock market have timestamps at the nanosecond level. So if you are developing algorithms for algorithmic trading, your data feed is going to be sequencing the trades at the nanosecond level. So only being able to operate at the microsecond level is a handicap. But in fact, what it means is that there are two different times going on. 
So within our own financial sector, within our own world, hidden beneath what seems to be relatively synchronized clocks is still time pluralism. And the world is a big place. Muslims still keep their own time. And you can get apps to tell you the Muslim prayer times. I'll pick your app carefully because if any of you are Muslim or have Muslim friends, you know that, for instance, Ramadan begins and ends on different days for different Muslims. The reason for that is there are debates about time pluralism within Islam. Do you determine the time based on direct observation or on calculation? Do you determine it based on a machine? Or do you determine it based on a chart? Or do you have to have reliable witnesses? And if it's reliable witnesses, where do the witnesses need to be? Do they need to be where you are? Or are the witnesses in Mecca good enough? You can see all the dimensions of debate. And as a result, while there are lots of high-quality apps for you to download to tell you the proper time for Muslim prayer and the top and the beginning of the various Muslim months, they don't agree. Which, at least where I teach at Queens College, leads to the unfortunate situation at the end of Ramadan of Muslims who are fasting while other Muslims are feasting. Orthodox Judaism maintains its own time scale, Zamanim. This site, my Zamanim, is a site that takes astronomical data and then you put in your precise location and if you're really, really uh, concerned about it, your altitude relative to the horizon and the uh, temperature and barometric pressure, because those affect refraction of the sun, and it will spit out a time of the appropriate time to pray in the Jewish tradition. So while we may think our clock time is the main time in the world, when you start thinking of the Muslims, start thinking of the Orthodox Jews, start thinking of the Hindus practicing their astrology, when you start thinking of Chinese astronomy and the timekeeping associated with that, you start to realize that we are still very much in a world of time pluralism. And for that matter, our own clocks are symptoms of compromises of time pluralism. Let's be honest. What we do is pretty weird. We have an hour system that comes from the Egyptians, a minute system that comes from the Babylonians, a calendar that is a Christian adaptation of a Roman calendar, the days of the week which come from ancient Greece, the analog display where the hand moves in a clockwise direction is a reference to Ptolemaic astronomy. We haven't quite caught up with Copernicus yet. Because if we were going to have a Copernican clock, then the hand would stay stationary and the dial would move. The fractions of a second are from the French Revolution. And we then have to make a choice whether we're going to use ancient Roman numerals or Arabic numerals. Even the clocks and watches we use represent generations of compromises between different time systems. In a way, every time you look at your watch, you are looking at a set of compromises. You're looking at a set of choices. Orology is a history of choices about time pluralism. And the reason we're not really aware of it is we tend to forget what wasn't chosen. Thank you. All right, if there are any questions for Professor Berth, uh, raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you. Hi, so first, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, one question is, so back in the day, you, you mentioned York and how they had all these different right. clock towers. Did each of those clock tower, towers agree to chime the, the, the same sort of type of time? Uh, no. Okay. No. Um, and we still have remnants of that. I mean, one of the things that we're fond of hearing is the Westminster chimes that are associated with Big Ben. But why do those chimes exist? Well, they were different chime patterns to indicate which bell tower was chiming. 
So different bell towers would have different sequences before they would chime the hour, and that way you would know which tower it was. Or um, you get into some cases, like the Abbey of St. Mary's doesn't have one bell. They have a whole bunch of different bells. And if you read the instructions for the monks, they are to pay attention to the bells based on their different sounds and sizes. So different bells make different sounds as well. So between the different sounds that different bells make and the chime patterns, uh, people would generally be able to know which institution was sounding the bell and whether they needed to pay attention to it or not. And like I said, the sort of survival of that is the chime pattern of Westminster. Thank you. Hi, thanks very much. Um, do you think that time pluralism is easier today to deal with than it was in, you know, let's say the late 17th century? Um, I think it's easier for members of the general public because they don't see it as much. As far as easier for people involved in time metrology, um, given some of the fights I've seen at conferences about the leap second, uh, where I was worried about whether the police needed to be called to separate people, um, I'm not sure I would describe that as easy. Or when you have um, a country like China saying, well, maybe we should bring back our timekeeping system. And when you start realizing the economic and cultural and regional power of China, and you start realizing, whoa, what if China does say, we want our time system to be recognized within the global system. You start realizing that within this, what I sometimes call the bubble of time metrology, it's not easy at all. It's a lot of very difficult decisions, negotiations, um, a lot of debate, sometimes anger. Uh, the first suggestion to get rid of the leap second occurred in the late 90s. They still haven't decided exactly what to do because they're still fighting over it. So for the general public, I think we don't see it, but we don't see a lot of things because we're just used to looking at the representation on a screen without realizing everything that's going into that representation. So we believe Google when, go when we do a Google search, and we believe that whatever Google comes up with for us is the best information for us. It's not. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, um, we believe Wikipedia because, hey, it's Wikipedia. Uh, yeah. Um, so when you actually start thinking of, in a way, the wizard behind the curtain, uh, you start to realize those are real people and they're facing real dilemmas and making real choices and having real problems making those choices. Thank you. Oh, and one more trick question. Is there a correct time? Uh, in yes. Your opinion, in your opinion. Yes. The correct time is whatever my watch says when I'm teaching a class. Thank you. <laughs> And the corollary of that is, as a professor, I can never be late for class. <laughs> what about um, maritime? What about maritime time? Right. Um, there's been a major transition. I'm not sure for the better, given the number of Navy ships that have run into things recently. Um, away from the use of chronometers and celestial navigation and more towards using electronic navigation and GPS. GPS is clocks in space. That's basically all it is. It's clocks in space sending out time signals. You, it, it sends out one time signal to synchronize your receiver and then there are typically between three and five other signals that you receive depending on how precise you want your location to be that then triangulate where you are on the planet. So GPS as maritime timekeeping works very different from the chronometers. Because the chronometers, it would be an offset from a particular meridian. In the case of recent history, it would have been the prime meridian. With GPS, it's not really an offset of a meridian. It's instead, GPS is set to the prime meridian. By default, it's set to coordinated universal time, and then you're dealing with signal delays determining distance from a satellite. In a way, the coexistence of the two would be its own 
time pluralism because they don't necessarily always agree. But like I said, the decision and the practice has been going more towards GPS and away from the traditional celestial navigation and away from the traditional use of chronometers to determine your, lat your longitude and then the use of observation to determine your latitude. There is a clear problem with that. Um, the simplest problem with that is that you can purchase GPS jammers. In fact, there are deliv truck delivery drivers who will purchase GPS jammers so that their employer doesn't know where their truck is. Now, if a truck driver can purchase a GPS jammer, you can be darn sure that our enemies, the people who want to disrupt shipping if they wanted to, could also get their hands on GPS jammers and create all sorts of problems for navigation. So there is this time pluralism that goes along with it. I wish there would be more reliance on the old systems of chronometers and celestial navigation as a form of redundancy for GPS because I don't think in this world today GPS is entirely reliable. And by the way, some of my friends in the Department of Defense don't think that either. All right, that's, mo oh, sorry. that's uh, modern time. Right. Maritime time. But what about ancient maritime time? After the discovery of longitude. Okay. Well, after the discovery of longitude, Ptolemy knew about longitude. So the theory that you could determine longitude by a time difference is quite old. The practice, as many know, is uh, John Harrison and his ability to create a chronometer that could stand the stresses of being on a ship. So um, longitude was used for uh, determining, um, time was used for determining position on land long before maritime timekeeping was able to do it at sea. Uh, at sea, what was used before Harrison um, was dead reckoning and the compass rose. You, the, there's a, uh, I don't remember the German rhyme, but it's basically a rhyme that goes something like, uh, the sun is to the north at midnight, the sun is to the south at noon, the sun is to the east at six, the sun is to the west at six. So there was an image that sailors had of the local position of the sun relative to the compass rose indicating the time of day. And then they might use that in terms of dead reckoning to figure out where they were. But as you know, what prompted the whole longitude prize was they were really quite terrible at it. But celestial time was not used, or was it used um, as a check in the back? Uh, if you're talking the celestial ways of determining longitude, they were typically not used at sea because you needed a stable platform to be able to make the readings with the um, astronomical instruments that were fine enough to be able to determine your longitude at sea, and that was difficult to accomplish. The other thing is that Neville Maskelyne, who, met, who was basically Harrison's nemesis and who mastered the calculations, it would take him four hours to calculate longitude based on the astronomical observations. Um, if you're at sea, you don't necessarily want to take four hours to figure out where you were four hours ago. You could be miles off course, but the other thing is a fundamental principle of a ship is it doesn't have brakes. <laughs> and, you know, that, that's a problem. If you determine that you aren't where you thought you were, well, who knows where you are then? You know, it's because you don't know how far you really traveled. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You could be way, way off. You know. Right. 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 So, uh, you know, the celestial uh, calculation didn't really catch on until there were better ways to do it more quickly. But even then, most people preferred using the chronometer because it was just elegant and easier to do. So, uh, I've got a question for you. Uh, the examples that that you've been giving are. 
uh, focused on planet Earth. Yep. And I'm sure you're familiar with uh, uh, Elon Musk's uh, grand uh, plans uh, to eventually have humans colonize Mars. Is time pluralism limited to uh, times just on planet Earth? And what's going to happen if and when we actually have humans on Mars? <laughs> um, it depends on who those humans are. Uh, you know, a someone who is willing to say that coordinated universal time is still the time that applies to Mars, because that's just universal time after all, and never mind that the Martian day is a different length. Um, they will have biological problems, because their body clock will adjust to the Martian cycles, even as they pay attention to a clock that's set to um, Earth time. So that would be a possibility. Another possibility would be a local Martian time and it's being represented in relationship to a earthbound time. I think that's actually the most likely possibility and the most humane one for anyone who would be on Mars. But, um, you know, there are other things to consider as well. What about a Muslim on Mars? Ramadan starts with a particular phase of the Earth moon that has to be observed by two reliable witnesses. Well, where are you going to get two reliable witnesses on Mars observing that phase of the Earth moon? Because you're already on the wrong side of the moon. What about um, Orthodox Jews on Mars? Where sunrise on Earth is such an important time and where their whole festival cycle is tied to the Middle East. What the heck's the Sabbath on Mars? I mean, so often when we think about time, we think from a secular American perspective, but when you start thinking about the global population and the fact that secular Americans are a minority of the global population, when Mars eventually gets settled, there'll come a point when there will be people on Mars that aren't necessarily secular Americans. They might be Chinese, they might be Hindu, they might be Jewish, they might be Muslim. And then there are all those debates from those cultural traditions entering into the time pluralism debates. So let Elon Musk know he's in for a lot of headaches about time, and it's not just the headaches he's probably anticipated. Hello, just two quick things. You mentioned how you said that you didn't want to talk about Anglo-Saxon hours, right. and I was curious as to why. And also, what are your thoughts about the whole daylight savings time thing? Oh, well, the second one is easy. It sucks. Um, no, from a chronobiological perspective, I'm interested in chronobiology, the biological cycles of our body. A one hour difference is jet lag. It's a minor jet lag, but it's jet lag nonetheless, and it doesn't do anybody any favors. It was an idea that maybe made sense when it was implemented in 1917, and a lot of work was still done by natural light. But in our day and age where most work is done under artificial light, it makes no sense whatsoever. So we should get rid of it. It's a dumb idea, and it's immensely irritating for a lot of people since there are no global standards for it whatsoever. And there are actually some countries that just wake up one morning and say, hey, today feels like a good day to have daylight savings time. So that's my view on that. Um, Anglo-Saxon time. There are a couple reasons why I didn't talk about Anglo-Saxon time. One is that we really don't know that much about it. Uh, what it was is it divided the day into eight segments. Uh, and we can find Anglo-Saxon sundials that do that. But as far as the amount of information on it, we really don't have that much. And after the Normans took over England, it, they pretty much wiped it out. So there's just not a lot of material there and there's no material on it relative to um, anything having to do with time pluralism. Although I can imagine in Roman Britain, you would have found some of these Britain timekeeping techniques and ideas coexisting with the Roman ones. And the Romans weren't actually in agreement with themselves. So there were debates within the Roman Empire of which calendar to use and whether the uh, fall equinox was really um, the day of the Emperor Augustus's apotheosis or whether it was just a equinox and screw Augustus. 
All right, let's give Professor Burth another hand.